Take one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Lieb. I founded SCAT in 1962 and we're here in 2022 to go for a tour. One thing that we were curious about earlier was how did you come up with the name SCAT? Because I've heard a couple of different stories and I just want to kind of clear the air. Well, what have you heard? And I'll tell you. I heard the one about your grandma or mom or somebody saying like SCAT, SCAT, get out. Is that the true one? That It started there, yeah. Back in the day, um, you know, I was a hot rodder, and uh, you know, guys would come by and say, "Hey, where'd you get that, or where'd you get this?" Well, in those days, you know, your source of parts was not AutoZone; it was a local wrecking yard. Yeah. Or in 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 my case, I lived in in North Inglewood, uh, next to the Baldwin Hills, and of course, people would abandon cars up in the hill. And uh, in fact, my roaster that I won the National Roaster Show with in 2010 and 2016 won the class and then uh, AMBRA. Um, the front brakes on that car came off of a 47 Ford that was rolled into a canyon. Oh and I, Because I owned the car since 1959. So that's, that's where the brakes came from. So, that's super you know, cool. that's just what we did. Uh, Southern California was a huge hotbed for engine rebuilding. We had extremely large engine rebuilders here. We had the Ford engine plant. Ford actually was had their own uh, engine rebuilding plant. Chrysler was here. Um, in those days, Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward, they all had in their catalogs, they had huge sections for uh, parts, so one of which was rebuilt engines and clutches and transmissions and so forth. So I'd scrounge the wrecking yards and get the parts and sell them to them. And one day downtown there was a, a company, a rebuilder called Piston Supply, and they supplied Pep Boys. And uh, they had a little problem with money, and so I would trade the cores, the used parts, for new parts. And the controller got upset one day because I wasn't paying sales tax and I didn't have a license. And so he was afraid that the you know, the, the folks in Sacramento would come in and slap his hand and give him a bill and a penalty. So he told me he either had to charge me sales tax or I had to get a license. Hmm. And of course, in those days, the sales tax was like two and a half or three percent. And of course, who was I to pay that three percent? So anyway, I went to the Department of Motor Vehicle, or, uh, Board of Equalization and uh, after school and put my three and a half dollars on the counter and filled out the paperwork and the gal behind the counter said, well, what's the name of your company? And I'm, I'm looking behind me and I've got this line of people and I'm holding everything up and I, I get embarrassed. And uh, the first thing that came to me was my grandmother and us kids where she, you know, chased us around. And I said, well, what about scat? And, you know, because it represents, you know, get out of here, you know, quick, you know, fast, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I mean, it was just like that, you know? <laughs> And uh, so she asked me if I wanted to write it or whether she did. And I said, no, you can write it. She says, you want to spell it with one or two T's? And I said, one. And that was the end of it. And uh, of course, since then, all my buddies, have, you know, the, the most common is Southern California auto thieves. But that's, uh -huh. they think that's a joke. But you never know. <laughs> <laughs> we have in our system uh, somewhere just short of 4,000 different crankshafts. And what that means, well, this is a good example. What that means is, is a packet of information like this. And this is a work order that goes into the shop. And this has every operation on it. And it has all the raw material. It has all the instructions for the operators, how to set the machine up, what machine to go into, and so forth and so on. And so we do everything from just inspecting and polishing the crankshaft to taking a piece of raw material and making the crankshaft 100% from scratch. We have probably 90% of the tractor pull market. So your John Deere, your Macy Ferguson, your International, uh, Alice Chalmers, you go down the list of all the tractors that you see in tractor pull, and we make the billet crank. So this crank, uh, this is a 619 John Deere, which is the biggest crank we can make. It's 43 inches in length, and it's 9 inches in diameter. That's our capacity. Now, the smaller crankshafts, these, uh, 
that's 912 Porsche. You know, it's 11 inches long, it's five and a half inches in diameter. So that's the smallest and that's the biggest. Wow, and just the size comparison is insane. Now this piece of steel, and there's some steel that you'll see as we move along. This piece of steel weighs 1,100 pounds when we start. And when we ship it, depending on the model, it'll weigh 275 pounds. Oh my god. When we ship it. So we've machined, we actually, percentage wise, 80% of the steel that we buy, we uh, throw away. Huh. Wow. Um, you know, just because of the machining operations and what yeah. we're starting with. We do some other interesting stuff. If uh, all of you get mail, and that little mail truck that comes by your house, the right hand drive mail truck that was made by General Dynamics, has an Iron Duke GM four cylinder engine in it that they stopped making in 1975 or 76, somewhere in there. And of course, there's 91,000 mail trucks. They don't have any money to buy new trucks. And they don't have any, so the and they don't have any money to repower them with a modern engine, so they have to rebuild the, you know, the engines that they have, and so we supply the, the postal service with the cranks and the connecting rods to do that, and we supply them, anywhere from 100 to 200 a month. Wow. So, and the most interesting project that we have, is, uh, and I don't know if you had lunch today, but if you did and you were at a deli and you got a sandwich that was either rye or pumpernickel or something like that with a hard crust bread. I'm interested to see where this goes. You ever think about how bread is sliced? Oh my goodness. I mean your mom, you know, or your girlfriend or your cousin or somebody bakes and they if they bake bread it comes out in a lump and so if it's sandwich bread and it's got 24 slices the way they do it is it comes down out of the pan and it comes down the chute and they've got a bandsaw that has a drum on it and it's got 24 bandsaw blades that are evenly spaced. The bread comes whistling through, it's sliced, gets automatically wrapped and off in the truck and into your mouth. Well, they can't do that with hard crust bread because what happens is if they run it through the bandsaw, it gets a bird just like when you saw wood. So what do they do? Well, this machine was invented in 1919 by a guy by the name of Hartman and he took an old Model T Ford engine, turned it upside down, took the rods out of it, turned them upside down, put a plate on top where the oil pan normally would be, and then the first, the two inner rods hooked to a rack of knives, and the two outer rods hooked to another rack of knives, and of course with an electric motor they turn it over and here's the knives oscillating like this, and the bread comes down through the knife and it doesn't leave a burr. Wow, that's, that's really so cool. strange. What an odd coincidence. So Cars what, and bread. Yeah, well, I mean, we go from one end to the other. But what happens is, uh, and we make, I don't know how many will be made this year, but we make 20 to 30 of those billet cranks for them every year. And we've wow. been doing that since, you know, almost the beginning of time, time <laughs> by Tom's time, anyway. So our, our daily processing, our benchmark, is 100 to 125 cranks a day and 1500 connecting rods that's our wow. daily production that is absolutely insane i mean you look around and you see how many you know cranks there are just like and it's it's amazing that you guys can produce that many a day let alone i mean well i thought and, that would be like a week or a month and and when i say processing what i'm talking about is that we start with just a lump of steel and or the inspection, like we talked about those 302 cranks. So a crank is a crank is a crank is a crank. So depending on where you know you start in the process, and where you start in the process is all about money. I mean, when you look at a 383 Chevy cast crank that retails for $250 or something, in today's world, in California, uh, $250 doesn't go very far, so you know we haven't done much to it. Uh, then you get into a John Deere crank, you know, and those crankshafts are twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars. Wow! So you know that the cost of the steel—I mean, the cost of the steel on that crankshaft, the cost of the steel and the heat treating so before we even scratch it, we've got you know four grand invested in the crankshaft before—I mean, just in the lump, like you'll see here. Machining apart, temperature is your 
as your enemy. And the, the, the heat treating processes are based on critical temperature. So the processes are done at different temperatures and if you, the quench and temper for most of the steel that we use is 1,050 degrees. And so when you start turning a metal blue, that means that you're up next to the critical temperature. And the problem with that, if you exceed the critical temperature, then you start to anneal it, which means you take the physical property out of it. Mm -hmm. So the cutting tools are designed, and the cutters, and the rake and the pitch on the, on the carbide cutters is designed to either pull or push the, the material off in such a manner that the friction that's caused to do that, the temperature goes off in the chip. So what happens is, is like those chips, you know, are blue, but if you look at the part, it's nice, shiny, you know, like it was machined. And so the temperature doesn't get to the critical temperature, which affects the, the material itself. Our competitors, when they do a crankshaft, in order for them to take the piece of steel and make it look like a crankshaft, it has to be annealed. In other words, it has to be soft. So they get it into the shape, and of course the crankshaft is a zigzag, and if you put it in the furnace, because it goes into the furnace uh, at 1600, 1650 degrees, and then they take it out and they dump it into glycol, which is, you know, um, you know, uh, antifreeze basically. They dump it into glycol, and then they temper it at 1050 degrees. So the problem here is that if they machine it like that, and then they go into the 1600 degrees to get the physical property of the of the crank and the metal, if they do that, the crank bends. Oh. And what happens with that? Well, you got to straighten it. So you can straighten it, but then you straighten it, and you got to go back to stress relief. And stress relief is done at 650 degrees for six hours, and the crank will bend again, but only half. So if it bent 100 thousandths, it comes back bent 50. You straighten it, you go back in, it comes back bent 25. You straighten it, you go back in, comes back out and it's bent 10, and then you machine it straight. We don't do any of that. So that if you buy a competitor's crankshaft, you've got 4,000 angry miles on it before you ever got it out of the box. Here you don't have that problem. This is, we have two of these. This one, you know, they were talking about six feet in the ground and 60,000 pounds and all that. And basically what's in here is this. It's a cutter that looks like that. And there's 42 pieces of carbide. And what happens is the crank goes in here like that. And so when you look at the machine here, the piece of steel fits in here like this and it's stationary, it doesn't move. And the cutter, you can see the cutter here. The cutter, this is a steady rest, you see the jaws, that comes out and grabs the crank where you're next to where you're cutting, just like this. And then this moves in the X and Y axis at the same time to generate a circle, to generate an ellipse, a cam shape, and you can change the, the radius on one degree increments. So you got 360 different positions that are possible in one rotation. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, the accuracy of this machine, to give you an example, when we do a John Deere crankshaft, when it goes into the crank mill, it comes out of there about 250, 300 pounds lighter. That's how much material we uh, remove. But if we put it between centers, the stroke and the index uh, Everything is plus or minus four to five thousandths. So everything is within ten thousandths of each other after you remove all that material. That's how accurate the machine is. Wow. This is a rod for GM. This is the uh, 922. It's the, the dot rod for the 454 engine. And we supply all this to GM. But right when on the stock connecting rods from the factory, they've got these lumps on each end, and they use that for balancing, so in other words, to remove material. See, the difference between a factory rod 
and a scat rod because this is a factory rod and we have to make it you know to their specs and that's the way it's made but you notice the lump on the end here and the lump here well when they go to balance the rods you grind that excess material off the problem with a performance rod to keep the weight down we don't have that lump so that's one of the ways that the rod is made lighter because that material is just along for the right it means nothing from a strength standpoint but if you start grinding on this because we've honed that to exact size what we do is we start to relieve the metal which means that's going out around Whoa. on this you don't have a problem because the roundness is here now if you ground that off into there you're going to have the problem but on a performance rod you can't do that so when we balance rods we match them. We make enough rods at a time that we can take, you know, like we do a crate at a time. So we've got 640 rods. That's 80 sets at a time. And we can sort them exact on the balance. So you got eight in each box that all weigh the same because there's enough of them there to do that. So there you are. I'm going home for dinner. <laughs> well, thank you for the tour. This was absolutely awesome. I can't thank you enough. It's amazing what all that you've built and just what you've accomplished. Well, just one day at a time. <laughs> you know, just a lot of days. Yeah. <laughs>